Before we go on to introduce the second lecture in our series, I want to say something about the background picture and the music used in our opening and closing credits for it. For our first series, A Pure and Remote View, it was natural to show a section of that great hand scroll uh, painting from which I took that title, that is Xiaogui's Pure and Remote View of Streams and Mountains, Qishan Qingyantu. Um, and I chose for the musical background the opening of a favorite old recording of mine from my days of collecting records passionately. Uh, that is the first violin concerto of Prokofiev as played by my favorite violinist Joseph Segetti uh, in a great 1934 performance with the London Philharmonic conducted by Sir Thomas Beecham. To introduce and conclude this, the lectures in our second series, I wanted to uh, I wanted to use both pictorial and musical evocations of the idea of figuratively gazing into the past, seeing and hearing in memory the images and sounds that had moved you deeply in your earlier life and that remain deeply embedded in your consciousness to be called up at will or by something that you see or hear. For music I chose one of the pieces in Ravel's piano suite called Le Tombeau de Couperin, uh, the Tomb of Couperin, in which he distantly echoes the style of that 18th century composer with a poignancy that uh, pulls at one's heartstrings, I think. And the pianist to play it, who could not be any other than my favorite pianist, one who also loves Ravel so much that she gave up three years of her career playing nothing, playing and recording nothing but Ravel, that is, my daughter Sarah. Uh, she, is not, she had not yet recorded the Tombeau de Couperin, but she did so, that is, several pieces from it, uh, especially for me at my special request. And we use one of them, the hauntingly melancholy Forlan, uh, as our background music. I'll be using more music from Ravel's suite, by the way, as played by Sarah, as background for some places in our series when I really don't have anything to say about the images that are appearing on the screen, but when I want to go on showing them anyway. Okay, as for the painting to use for this opening and closing, I chose one that also carried uh, that special kind of significance for me personally. That is Law Ping's uh, portrait of the artist friend Eon, painted in 1798, the year before the artist died, uh, so it's one of his very last works. Um, this was a painting that I acquired myself in 1954, just as I was leaving Japan at the end of my Fulbright year there. I bought it from my favorite dealer, Eda, Eda Bungado, Yuji Eda, for about $250, which was a lot of money for me at that time. And I used it as the last painting in my 1960 Skira book as a fitting conclusion, as I felt then, for that book. I gave up the Law Ping painting in the divorce settlement with my first wife in 1988, and I have no idea where it is now. Uh, but to convey what the painting means to me and why I believe it to be ideal for opening these lectures, I want to read what I wrote about it in my Scarab book at the very end of that book. I do this instead of finding new things to say about it, uh, because that young person who wrote that final page around 1959, who is referred to in the jacket blurb as that brilliant young American specialist James Cahill, uh, he was able to use language to convey subtle and uh, subtle ideas and feelings about paintings in ways beyond the capacity of this old person, what this old person can do now. So here we go, the final pages of James Cahill, Chinese painting, Geneva, Scara, 1960. Okay. Here we go. In the winter of 1798, less than a year before his death, Lo Peng re-encountered briefly an old friend called Eon, whom he had not seen for nine years and painted for him as a farewell present the picture with which we shall conclude uh, our consideration of Chinese painting. 
It is simultaneously a portrait of his friend of the and of the Tang poet Meng Haoran, whose fondness for blossoming plum is recalled in the branch held by the figure. Lao Peng's poetic inscription refers to another poem by Meng Haoran's great contemporary Li Bo, in which Li tells of finding a line of poetry while walking in the forest and resolves to save it to present to his friend Meng, implying that Meng, of all people in the world, was the one who would best understand it and use it. Lao Peng's allusion thus suggests by analogy the depth of his friendship with Eon. The old man stands beside a fantastic, fantastically hollowed rock, his head slightly bent, uh, inhaling the fragrance of the blossoming uh, of the blossoms with conscious aestheticism. The sensitively drawn face wears the look of world-weary melancholy, so intense as to seem a bit grotesque. But this is not caricature or satire. It is the same subtle playfulness that gave its special flavor to the autumnal scene of Hua Yen, a painting that I reproduced earlier. It is the kind of undirected irony, serving only to suggest that emotions uh, once presented seriously with an implicit demand that they be taken at face value can no longer be so treated, however sincerely they may be felt in actuality. In spite of this, perhaps be partly because of it, the pathos of the figure is strangely affecting. Lao Ping draws in a style derived largely from that of Chen Hong Shou, uh, and I refer back to a Chen Hong Shou painting, who had himself formed his figure style through half serious play upon an archaic manner. The whole expressive character of the picture and its inscription thus depends upon an elaborate dialogue between present and past, between an individual of the highest sensibility and a cultural heritage of which he was perhaps excessively aware. The painting contains so many levels of meaning as to invite one to read still more into it. In admitting this, we may still wonder as we look at it whether Lao Ping was not conscious of standing near the end of a long evolution, contemplating the past with the same mild sadness as the figure he portrays. The painting sums up the special virtues of the last phases of that evolution, but also exemplifies the paradoxes and contradictions that had penetrated to the very heart of Chinese painting, awkwardness sublimated into a kind of skill, individuality manifested in archaism, straightforward feeling set forth through oblique allusions, serious points disguised as pleasantries. Every further degree of concern with such interplay of opposites, every additional layer of stylistic reference, had separated the artist that much more from the once possible forthright approach to the world. Thirteen centuries had passed since Chung Bing had gazed at the landscape painted on the walls of his room and relived the travels of his youth. Eight since Zhao Chong had held a flower in his hand and transcribed it in painting. A good part of the later history of Chinese painting testifies that withdrawal from nature as a direct source for the content of an, of art, of an art need not mean the death of that art. But when the withdrawal has proceeded as far as this, when simple aesthetic values have been so thoroughly replaced by those so very sophisticated and the sustaining of a high level of quality requires artists more sensitive and endowed with more creative force than were to appear after Lao Ping. The rest of Chinese painting was to remain, although not always ex as explicitly as Lao Ping's work, and seldom so movingly, a meditation upon the past. My first lecture in this series was on an artist of the Yuan Dynasty and a painting done in the late 14th century. Uh, for this one, I will leap forward some six centuries to the 20th and talk about an artist named Cheng Shi Fa who lived and worked in China. He was born there in 1921, five years before myself, uh, dying in 2007. How many years that is before myself remains to be seen. Um, He's one of the, I'll be, in these, art, in these lectures, I'll be giving a series of lectures on, uh, later, on uh, artists of the recent past to my new, especially the artists who are called Guohua, or traditional artists, literally. Artists who followed the 
basically Chinese tradition, instead of being the so-called avant-garde artists, those are all terms that are a little problematic now, but we haven't really replaced them yet. Anyway, I knew quite a few of these Guohua artists. Uh, I wrote uh, jacket, uh, exhibition blurbs and other and essays for some of them, and um, uh, the, but one of them in particular, Cheng Shi Fa. Uh, I, I want to single him out for a longish lecture, uh, which I'm now introducing. Because, both because I was close to him for the last 30 years or so of his life, and also because I think he merits a reconsideration as an artist of real achievement, uh, who I suspect is somewhat undervalued because he painted along with his really fine works uh, a lot of popular pictures that have hurt his reputation, I think. I met him first in 1973, toward the end of our archaeology delegation trip to China. I'd been going around asking people, can I meet Cheng Shi Fa? And mentioning his name, and the day finally came when a few of us were taken to the Shanghai Painting Academy, and I was introduced to him by someone who said something like, here is the young man who's been going around China for a month saying that he wants to meet Cheng Shi Fa. And we were instant friends, as this photo reveals. And we remain so, meeting off and on until his death in 2007. The next, please. Cheng Zhifo was first brought to my attention by C.C. C. Wang. Before I went to China, he showed me, on one of my many visits to his New York apartment, an album by Cheng that he had bought, telling me, this is a Chinese artist you have to pay attention to. The 12-leaf album had been painted by Cheng Zhifo in 1962 and it represented the subject he had chosen, with some help from his government and his superiors, that is, as the main theme of his paintings, the lives of a minority people, the Dai, in the southeast province of Yunnan, especially their children, whom he had observed on one of those trips that PR Chinese artists were obliged to make as part of their obligation for being supported by the state. The authorities believe that having the lives and activities of minority peoples depicted by the best artists would help to integrate them into their very diversified population and make the majority Han people more comfortable with them. Next, Cheng's inscription, which follows the paintings, as commonly in albums, consists of a poem and a prose note after it, seen in this slide, that begins with the date, saying he is painting it at a window looking out at the rain. It's the May or Japanese Bayou plum rain season in late spring, when dampness causes everything in your closets to mildew. The twelve paintings he writes are based on his journey to the West, an allusion to a famous Buddhist text. He adds this poem a note he writes some days later after the rain had stopped, and he adds titles for the twelve paintings. I'm not following this order in showing them as I should, but I'll show them in an order chosen arbitrarily to suit my present purpose. Next. This, the first of the leaves I'm showing, out of order, is an evening scene. The setting sun and roosting birds appear in upper, upper left, while below, minority children with colorful costumes and turbans are returning home on the backs of water buffalo, carrying fruit that they have picked. Above are the tops of banana trees. Chung's inscription on it, written as he says, at the rainy window, calls it Evening scene with a grove of banana trees. Next, a detail from this leaf. Si Si Wang pointed out to me that the incisiveness of Cheng Zhi Fa's line drawing is a master of that, beyond most other artists of his time, and how he sets it against what appears to be freely splashed areas of ink and color used for the buffalo's tufts of hair on their heads and along their backs. As we'll see, it was a prominent feature of Cheng Zhi Fa's style to combine semi-random splashes of this kind with fine-drawn detail. That the best of the overseas Chinese artists around this time, Zhang Da Chen, Chen Chi Quan, Xi Xi Wang himself, others, were just then experimenting with combining semi-controlled splashes of ink and color with some fine drawing, more of the former, less of the latter in their cases typically, uh, all this made this style of Cheng Shi Fa seem especially timely and interesting. Next, please. Another leaf. I'm showing them, as I say, in no special order. 
again painted as he writes on it at the newly cleared window, that is a window looking out on a scene just after the rain has stopped. Two of the minority children who spent most of their days herding buffalo, goats, and sheep, or caring for chickens, here are resting on a simple bamboo pier built out over the water. Chung is visually specific about the coloring of the bamboo and how it's tied together, even to how its fibrous end looks when it's broken. I can't tell you what the children are holding. They are watching two birds that swoop down toward the water, beaks open as though singing. This is an unlikely scene, perhaps, and we're presented here already with Chung's free manipulation of reality for his purposes. Next, please. In this leaf, a girl is carrying two bags of flowers on a bamboo pole over her shoulder, bringing them back for sale, presumably in her village, and also accompanying her ox or buffalo. The way Chung Shifa lets us see them through the trees and the way he depicts the trees in gray-green washes, contrasting with the brighter colors and the sharpness of the girl and the ox, make the composition interesting. The girl looks slightly sideward as if it's something she's watching. While claiming only to be recording what he saw in the Dai region, Chung is in fact creating a brilliant new style for what was in his time a politically required, or at least a politically encouraged subject, not necessarily required anyway. Okay, the next please. For this leaf, another girl carrying flowers, looking like yellow daffodils, crosses a stream on stepping stones and smiles down at a flight of birds, small swallows, that she is disturbed and that fly away with their beaks open, chirping, a theme that must have been in some part politically prescribed, prescribed, I mean, uh, the closeness of these minority people to nature and to the living things around them is taken up by Chung Shu Fa and played with, brought to the edge of sentimentality. But look also at how well he's caught in his remarkable line drawing, the distribution of weight on the girl's two legs and her raised foot. Uh, the next, please. If that one was close to the edge, this one is surely on it or over it and obliges us to confront a big problem in appreciating and evaluating the work of Chung Shu Fa. The turban girl has set down her load, two bags of flowers hung on a pole over her shoulder, at a place where two fine stalks of bamboo grow, to rest and to watch two egrets, I think they are, that have come to roost on her burden. We may think all the way back to Southern Sung Academy paintings by Ma Yuan and others, in which the scholar gentleman waits very quietly to see the deer or the birds that come to the stream in his garden. But those gentlemen walked with an attitude of detachment, not trying to interact or commune with the other creatures. Chung Shu Fa is creating what is in part a fantasy world in which the communion between the children and the natural creatures they encounter in their daily lives is idealized, somewhat fantasized, given a charmingly anecdotal character. Next, please. More quickly, going through the rest of the leaves. In this one, uh, the girl rides the girl oxherd, that is, rides on the animal's back as it wades through the deep water. An egret watches from the lower corner. Again, the setting of fine drawing against less controlled areas of heavy ink and blue color for the ox, and the pushing of the parts of the picture in up to upper and lower extremes leaves the main area empty, and it's an original and engaging composition. Next. In this one, a girl in the long skirt and striped sleeve similar to costumes I remember seeing Korean girls and women wearing, is feeding some kind of fruit or berry to a deer, holding more of them behind her. Chung Shu Fa claims in his inscriptions on these that they are based on scenes and events that he himself saw, and no doubt they are, however distantly. Girls and deer were to become favorite subjects for Chung, who painted them over and over, as we'll see. Next. Here the boy and girl are resting with their charges, two goats and three kids. The girl reads a picture book, which looks like one of the Lianhua, or serial picture book, that Chang Shu Fa himself made. The boy plays a flute. They sit on a mat of broad leaves. This is another composition in which the contrast between the large, free strokes of ink and splashes of wash used for the goats contrasts effectively with the fine-lined delineation of the children. Next, the detail. The drawing of the kids in paler, broad strokes is midway between line and wash. These contrasts create a visual excitement that is just what C.C. Wong admired in Chang Shifa's painting, 
and I enjoyed him in that. The kids, by the way, and the sense of small goats, not the children. Okay, here, next. Well, <clears throat> with this leaf, however, we're decidedly over the edge into sentimentality or the realm of children's stories. The little goatling helps the girl place a cover over the baby who lives in a basket holding a berry on a stem to put in its mouth. The basket is set on a broad banana leaf, a tall neck vase of some kind, presumably containing something to drink, perhaps for the baby, is placed beside them, a drinking glass on its top. Chung does not claim in his inscription on this that it's something he saw, but only notes that it's a redrawing of a picture that he had painted earlier. Next. So you begin to see some of the trouble one encounters in appreciating Chung Shifa's paintings. Do we have to allow for lapses of taste? But then look at how he catches the girl's concerned look, how the hand holding the basket is the blanket is drawn, how the rougher strokes of varying width used for the basket are just right for that. How many other artists, old or new, could strike that kind of balance between realistic drawing and visually engaging brushwork? Not very many. Next, please. Well, looking quickly at the remaining leaves, in this one, a boy and girl are enjoying the company of recently hatched chicks. Other artists, notably Chi Baisher, also painted chicks, but without communicating this kind of delight that they inspire in us, especially when we're children. The row of 14 chicks in the upper right could be analyzed compositionally, like Moochie's Six Persimmons, but I'll spare you that. Next, please. Here, a little girl seems to be congratulating the hen on her achievement, which is drawn in the foreground. I can't help looking at this without remembering a morning in Berkeley when Chung Shir Fa's son, Duo Duo, who had come from China and was staying with us before moving to the International Student House, was trying to convey what he would like for breakfast. Failing to do it in language, he seized a piece of paper and a ballpoint pen and drew a perfect Chung Shir Fa hen. And then behind and below it, the ovoid shape that told us he would like an egg. I saved that picture for a long time. Next, please. Uh, the last leaf with an inscription reading, Festival Dance, on the Li Chiu Day, the first day of autumn in the lunar calendar of the Runyon year, 1962, I illustrate or depict what I saw at a village of the Dai minority, written in a western corner of Shanghai, Shurfa, with his seal, Chung, reading Chung. The boy is beating a long-ended drum, the girl clashes cymbals. The younger girl strikes a sounding stone or something like that, maybe like the triangle in the timpani section of our orchestras. And it's indeed a timpani performance done to go with the festival dancing of this minority people. The boy's face is brown, but both of the girls, like those in other pictures of them by Chung Shir Fa, their faces are light, even white, with reddish cheeks. Next, please. Uh, that album, owned by C.C. Wong, was not only not the only work by Chung Shir Fa that I knew about before I met him in China. I had purchased in Hong Kong a copy of his two-volume series of illustrations to Lu Xun's True Story of A Q, A Q Zheng Zhuan, that masterpiece of modern Chinese literature, published first in 1922-23, to 23, as the first serious piece of literary writing to be written in vernacular Chinese. You can read a translation of it on the web by googling Lu Xun and A Q. Next. Chung Shifa's work, published in two volumes in 1962, is a series of 108 illustrations of this story, with brief excerpts from Lu Xun's text printed on the opposite pages. These do not make up the entire text, which was easily available to anybody in China, but they only give brief excerpts from those passages that Chung illustrates. Chung Shifa's work is an especially fine example of a genre popular in China at that time called Lianhua, serial pictures, which were strongly promoted by the Maoist government as part of the program to bring art to the common people. They deserve a special study by some art historian. Uh, I once thought of doing it, but didn't. Certainly can't now. Chung Shir Fa did several others, but this is by far his finest. Next, please. Chung's pictures were especially well handled by the printers. He must have worked with them to develop a mode of reproduction that captures more than is ordinarily possible in printed pictures of his dry and wet brushwork, his variations in tonality, 
the special quality of his line. This is true of the first edition. A reprint made some years later is not so successful, lacking the color. So if you can find a copy of this original 1962 edition at a price you can afford, buy it immediately. Next, please. I will devote too long addenda to this lecture to reading translations from these brief texts, or excerpts from them, the parts most relevant to the pictures, while showing all 108 of the pictures. So I won't do more now than to say that these AQ illustrations by Chung Zhufa struck me immediately as brilliantly original and powerful pictures. Like most Berkeley people at that time, the late 1960s into 70s, I was enamored of leftist political art. We could sing all the six songs for democracy from the Spanish Civil War. We were passionately attached to, or at least I was, the Bertolt Brecht Kurt Weill Threepenny Opera. More on that in another lecture. And I went weekly to Stiles Hall, a kind of radical YMCA branch just outside campus, where we would learn to dance the Korobushka, <laughs> the Russian dance, and watch films about the Chinese agrarian reformers, very much leftist. So when I went to China in 1973, I dreamed of finding there and helping to encourage a great new age of political art led by Chiang Shifa, the kind of that Germany had produced in the days of the Weimar Republic before Hitler. Next, please. A, power, a politically powerful pictorial art of the kind produced by George Gross, a painting by him at left, Katie Kolwitz, a print by her at right, and others. I was naive. I should have been aware by then of Mao's and Zhang Xing's insistence on an art for China that was purely positive in character and would be popular with the people. I could expand on that theme and talk about how on our second delegation in 1977, after the death of Mao and the fall of Zhang Qing and her gang of four, the Chinese that we met were happy to see an end to all that and to be able once more to watch dramas that didn't always have to end happily. I remember that very well. Next, please. Well, this is about as close as Chiang Shifa came to doing a really political painting, and it isn't very close. He painted it in 1964 to illustrate a saying by Chairman Mao about the East is Red. It's a big painting, 56 inches in height, 32 inches wide. It was my own, bought in Hong Kong. I'm giving it this year to our Berkeley Art Museum. I had to keep it in Hong Kong for years, unable to import it, because of the stupid embargo that the U.S. government had placed against things made in China to keep, to keep funds from getting back to communist China, as it was then called. Mostly I was able to evade this by bringing paintings in my luggage, but this one was too big, and the date in the Chairman Mao quote made it, as I remember calling it, the ultimate unimportable painting. But eventually, of course, I was able to bring it in after the stupid embargo was reversed. Next, please. The same children, the same goatlings, seen in the album, are here seen above and below a great expanse of red leaves. In my lecture on early Chinese landscape, I often showed how good artists were able to keep an area of repeated forms, which might become visually flat and dull, somehow interesting. This expanse of red leaves is a modern example of that achievement. It's easy to say, as U.S. newspaper critics did later about Chiang Shifa's paintings, when we exhibited them, uh, exhibited them at our University Art Museum, that Chung was showing a low popular taste. But we have to understand his whole achievement in the context of his time and the circumstances in which he lived and worked. Mao and Zhang Cheng were strongly pushing the idea that art should be for the masses, the common people, understandable and enjoyable by them. If Chung Shifa had lived in another kind of society, the kind that permitted or encouraged an art of strong political statements, the Bertolt Brecht, Kurt Weill kind of powerful political statements, he could have done that. How well he could have done it is indicated by the power of his AQ illustrations, but that wasn't possible, or only possible when illustrating a text that had that power, and others weren't available to him in China at that time. Next, please. Back to our meeting in the Shanghai Painting Academy in 1973. I put beside us a photo of Nixon and Mao meeting a few years earlier. I used to use this pairing in lectures to amuse audiences and show a real Chinese-American friendship as against a false political one. Chung was only one of a number of artists of the Academy, the Shanghai Painting Academy, that is, who welcomed us and who painted pictures for the delegation members who had come, 
four or, four or five of us, I remember. Next, please. Among the older artists there were Wang Goyi and Tang Yun, both specialists in bird and flower painting in the tradition of Wu Changshu. I think this is Wang Goyi painting. Uh, it's a minute, yeah. I think this is Wang Goyi painting one of them for a 1973 delegation member. Next, please. Members of our 1977 delegation also visited the Shanghai Painting Academy. That was the Chinese painting delegation led by myself. In the photo at left, one of the artists is painting a picture for Wen Feng, and at right, Zhu Ji John, the oldest member of the Academy, who lived, as I remember, to the age of 107, was it, or 105, I don't remember. Anyway, painting a picture of prawns for Nelson Wu, seen in the background. Zhu Ji John was later to come to San Francisco after painting a big landscape picture for a new airport building. San Francisco and Shanghai were sister cities, and Shanghai, faced with sending a gift for the new International San Francisco Air Terminal, chose its oldest artist to paint it. Zhu Jidan was also to come to Berkeley, ha, ah, to be entertained by me and my students. But that's another story, and a very good one. Next, please. This is a large picture by Zhu Jidan. It was on view in the Academy during our 1977 trip. The artists could not, of course, paint pictures as large and elaborate as this on the spot for delegation members. The time was too short. Paintings like this one are put on display for us to see and photograph. The next, please. Another of his paintings, this one painted in 1981, representing autumn melons uh, growing by a fence, which I must have photographed at some later time. And the next, please. These are two more by other artists that were on display in 1973. I don't remember the artist's names. A big painting of an abundant harvest depicting a pile of some kind of beans and a bag of them. And a portrait of Lu Xun by one of the figure painters in the Academy. Next. Chung Shu Fa painted a picture for me on the 1973 visit, of course, and I took sides of him doing it. It would have been better if I had a movie camera and filmed him as people film Picasso doing a drawing during his last years. But I didn't have one, and these will have to serve. He began, as expected, with the big ink splashes that would only later become representational elements in his picture. In themselves, they were ambiguous, pictorially uninformative, so to speak. The early ink splashes tongue to early Sung that Shimada writes about in his E. Pin article on the untrammeled style of painting, which I mentioned in my earlier lectures, uh, used to splash the ink in this way, or more radically, and then amaze the onlookers by turning their splashes into parts of pictures. So Chung's performance had something of that character. Next, please. A quickly drawn head and horns reveal that it's a deer. The fast way he worked was impressive, and I'm sorry I can't show it to you in a film. How fast and surely his, his hand and his brush moved. The next, please. As he went on drawing, we could see that one of his minority people girls was standing beside the deer, smiling and holding a bunch of flowers. Uh, the deer appears to be lifting its head as if to nuzzle her face. Next, please. Um, then the ink drawing finished, he quickly added colors, mixing them in the dishes you can see on the table at the bottom of some of these slides. Next. The painting finished, he quickly inscribed it, his hand still moving very fast. Next. And there was the finished work, which he held up for all of us to see. The inscription reads, as a remembrance of this occasion for Professor Gao Zhu Han, my Chinese name, 12th month, third day of 1973, Chang Fa drew this in Shanghai. I don't need to add that I had it mounted as a hanging scroll and I still treasure it. Next. Here to conclude this part of my account are two more by Chang Fa that were hanging or shown to us on our 1977 trip to the Shanghai Painting Academy. They don't suggest that he had changed either his style or his subject in the four years since my previous visit. Next. But there was no reason why he should. None of the pressures of the market and of critics that force artists in our society to appear to evolve continually, as if they, if they are to survive as significant. They have to be doing something new, new, new. All right. Now I'll go back to Chang Fa's earliest period and offer a quick account of how he had, in fact, evolved or developed as an artist up to the time I met him. I'll show the paintings quickly because I have little to say about them, apart from this is what he was doing in such and such a year. Next, please. This landscape that he painted in 1946, I seem to have in two images. 
one of them copied from a reproduction of a Chinese publication, the other from the original, but I can't remember where I saw it. It's a landscape with red leaf trees and fog floating around the base of the hills. In style, it shows that Chung Shifa had already, by 1946, mastered the orthodox manner of landscape, as it was still being used with its controlled brushwork, coloring that alternated warm and cool, yellow-orange and blue-green, in a manner that went back at least to the time of Wang Yuanqi in the early Qing period. He probably learned it at the Shanghai Art College, where he had been studying. It was not a way of painting that he would continue to practice, but it was one that he had to master if he was to be taken seriously as an artist in China, even the new China that professed to scorn the orthodox tradition. Shanghai painters like Wu Hu Fan and his disciples were still making the practice and appreciation of it, of orthodox landscape painting, that is, basic to their discipline. Next, please. The other painting was done 10 years later in 1956, and it takes for its subject a fishing port. It shows some originality, but it's still short of indicating maturity in its artist. Chung had been born in Sungjong near Shanghai in 1921. He studied medicine, but then turned to painting, and graduated from the Shanghai Art College in 1941. He had his first exhibition in 1942. Uh, next, please. Two paintings he did in 1957, both images made from reproductions. By this time, he had taken on the lives and customs of peasants and minority peoples as a principal theme. He had also established himself as an illustrator and artist of lianhua, or serial pictures. He did quite a few of these, most of them unknown to me. Somebody else is going to have to track down copies and study them and write about them. Next, please. This, copied from a reproduction in a 1957 magazine, is one of his illustrations presumably done in that year. It exhibits that ability to produce romantic and popular pictures that was the basis of much of his success. Fortunately, he didn't remain tied down to this manner, which, like most popular painting being done in the PRC at that time, didn't rise above the level of magazine illustration. Next, please. These two, both from the year 1959, paintings, that is, were in the collection of V.C. Guo, a collector in Hong Kong, who was buying paintings by PRC artists in large quantities, and whom I visited his place in Aberdeen, on the other side of the island, whenever I went to Hong Kong over some years. Uh, V.C. Guo made his living by, re by importing marine engines from Japan and selling them to boat users there. But his avocation was buying paintings by major PRC artists. He had hundreds of them, bought cheap as they came out of China. The Chinese government was making its artists produce lots of paintings for sale abroad to bring foreign money into China. Not much of the money. I recall Chung Shu Fa telling me only about 15%, 15%, that is, went to the artists. Guo's collection, or most of it, was eventually sold at auction. The painting, the picture of a woman arranging flowers in a vase is attractive but undistinguished, I think. This is an old subject in China. The other one of a baby girl lying on a red mat with pigeons in, front of, pigeons in front of her and above her, is more interesting and points toward Chang Shifa's specialty in later years, children in close relationships with uh, animals and uh, birds. Okay, next please. Two minor paintings of the demon quiller Zhong Kui with his sister, a popular subject because the paintings could be hung on certain days as auspicious images. These two were, were for sale in Hong Kong uh, the bookstore and painting sales room called Jigu Jai. I photographed them there, as I did many, many things, but I didn't want to buy them. They're interesting, but scarcely distinguished. Next, please. Now we sidetrack for a bit to consider Chung Shu Fa as a landscapist. He didn't continue long in the orthodox manner, fortunately, and he showed some real originality in the few examples that I've seen. Lucy Lim, the director of the Chinese Culture Center in San Francisco, with whom I and Michael Sullivan worked in organizing the 1983 exhibition Contemporary Chinese Painting, an exhibition from the People's Republic of China. I helped with the selection and wrote an essay for the catalog. Lucy Lim was especially admiring of Chung Shu Fa's landscapes and brought several of them for herself and her brother. This is one of them, painted in 1962. Something of the combination of freely applied washes of ink and color with fine line drawing that Chung uses in his figure and animal paintings is also used here. 
and it points the way into a new and interesting landscape manner that Chung could have developed, but the few of his landscapes that I've seen only hint at that. He didn't, alas, go on to develop this genre into a distinct personal manner. Next, please. This detail of the hilltop shows him admirably in control of his washes and using them in original ways. Behind this manner lies the example of Shur Tao, who was already exploring related mating styles of the late 17th century. Chang Shur Fa, like other recent Chinese artists, was an admirer of Shur Tao and learned from his paintings. He owned at least two of them himself, and he took me to visit an important Shanghai collector who had major examples. Next, please. This fine small painting, done by Chang Shur Fa in 1973 and owned by Lucy Lim's brother Edward Lim, is a further indication of how the artist was moving into a highly accomplished new style. An old plum tree in the foreground, seeming dead, still manages in early spring to put forth a few red blossoms, the only touches of color in the painting, apart from two yellow-lighted windows. The buildings of the town behind are drawn in that remarkable manner, midway between wash and line, that we saw in a few of his figure and animal paintings. It's used a special effect here, in a manner for which one could revive the old term painterly, German malerisch. Chungerfa's knowledge of Western painting and watercolors also must, have, must underlie in some part his move into this new manner of landscape. This was truly a genre that Chung should have pursued, but if he did, I don't know where the paintings have gone. They haven't, to my knowledge, been pu published in accessible places or purchased for important collections. The popular demand for Chung Shifa's paintings of figures, and especially of minority children with animals, was too strong and insistent. And in PR China, an artist did not have the freedom of choice that artists outside enjoy. We have to remember that in 1973, China was still under the strict domination of Zhang Qing and her Gang of Four, and that they were very hard on artists whom they considered guilty of bourgeois formalism. Art had to be upbeat and appeal to ordinary people. Chung Shifa's direction as a painter, that is, wasn't a matter up to himself. We can regret what was lost while sympathizing with his situation. Next, please. Back to his more familiar subjects. At left, a painting from 1959 in V.C. Guo's collection. At right, one from 1960, I think from the same collection, but I'm not sure. By this time, Chung Shifa had made his visit to the Dai people in Yunnan and had begun to paint the subject we're familiar with, the girl with goats and bags of flowers on a pole over her shoulder, the two children playing drum and cymbals for the festival dance, used also in the last leaf of his 1962 album that we began with. We should remember that he acknowledges reusing some of his compositions in his inscriptions on those leaves. The new subject matter permits him to use brighter colors and more dynamic compositions allowable or even encouraged in depictions of minority people. Next, please. A few more quickly to finish this series. The little girl on the one at left, painted in 1960, with a broad hat shading herself and her baby charge, uh, reads a book while the billy goat and kids, for which she is also caring, rest quietly in the foreground. In the one at right, painted in 1959 and belonging to V.C. Gua, the girl carries on her head a broad dish full of baby chicks. In the foreground are the cock and hen, presumably the parents of the chicks. Next, please. Here, a horizontal picture in which the girl goat herd has put down her load of flowers to tend to the goats, who are also her charges. As in some others, this effectively sets the heavy ink drawing of the animals in foreground against the fine line and color portrayal of the girl her extended foot in one manner, the goat's hoof next to it in the other. It's easy enough to see why these became so popular and why the pressure on Chung Shur Fa to produce them in quantity became so heavy. Next, please. Finally, these two, both painted in 1963 and in the collection of V.C. Guo, formerly, that is. I'm deliberately showing more paintings of this kind by Chung Shur Fa than you probably want to see to emphasize on the one hand, how he responded to what must have been a heavy demand with a certain repetitiveness, but on the other, the unfailing compositional inventiveness and technical brilliance that makes any one of these paintings 
worth owning and spending time with. Chung sustains his originality in the one it left by restricting the ink splashes to the goat's backs of heads and drawing the rest of them in fine lines that is remarkably successful in defining their bulk. In the one it should write, by perhaps overdoing his free ink splashing so that the goat's forms are not easily readable. The next please. In that same year, 1963, Chang Shifao also painted this extremely fine picture of two characters from the drama The White Serpent. This one I bought for myself and still own and treasure. I wish that Chung had done more work of this kind, pictures of scenes from the Chinese opera or the popular theater. They put to good use his great skill at characterizing the figures he depicts by how he depicts them and at suggesting relationships through sub subtle compositional means. Next. When he organized the 1984 Contemporary Chinese Painting Exhibition for the Chinese Culture Center in San Francisco, as I talked about before, its director Lucy Lim with Michael Sullivan and myself, I insisted that a figure painting by Chung Shifa had to be included in addition to the landscape and flower paintings that Lucy wanted. We finally settled on this one, a work from 1980 representing Shi Kong, one of the third century seven sages of the bamboo grove, calmly playing his chin as he awaits execution. He was condemned to death for offending an imperial prince. A photograph taken at one of the openings at the uh, Chinese Culture Center. That's Lucy Lim at the far left. Uh, it's the best fig painting I have, fig photograph that I happen to have of her. Actually, it's Wu Guanzhong, a different artist, still alive as far as I know or recently deceased, who uh, stands next to him, and myself, and anyway, and others. Uh, okay, I put that on just to show Lucy Lim as I talk about her. But now back to the painting in our exhibition catalog. I was talking about his, his uh, representation of Shi Kong, one of the seven sages of the bamboo grove, which we included in this exhibition. A girl beside him holds a bronze pot and a flat bowl, perhaps with the poison that he was to drink. One is reminded of the death of Socrates. Stems of plucked flowers lie on the ground around him. I don't know the significance of these. This detail reveals that that, that combining of sure representational drawing with loose brushwork that Chung Shui Fa could still accomplish. Next, please. Shi Kong's head, uh, a detail. He was by this time blind, painted in the dry brush strokes that Chung was using for much of his figure painting, marvelously using. Okay, hard to think of an artist who uses dry brushwork so well. And it's somewhere between Chinese style and Western style. Okay, anyway, I've made that point. Um, newspaper critics of the Bay Area were not uh, impressed. Uh, the, the picture, I think, is deeply moving if one is willing to be moved by serious representations of this kind. But newspaper critics, as I say, were not impressed. And I took them to task in my essay for the catalog, pointing out, as Peter Seltz had pointed out some years earlier in his catalog for the exhibition titled New Images of Man at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, pointing out that figure painting in our time, Western figure painting, needed some touches of irony, some indication of the artist distancing himself from his subject, from full endorsement of the subject. We seemed unable to produce and appreciate serious figure painting anymore. I use this as an example of how, as I called it, some of what we initially perceive as China's problems can be turned around and recognized as our own. We were unable, that is, to accept Chinese political figure painting, even, even when it was not kitschy and propagandistic, because the artists, as I put it, mean what they paint in a way that our artists don't but I'll let you read that essay for yourselves. Next, please. Now I want to return to the biographical and autobiographical mode to continue my account of my friendship with Chung Shui Fa. I visited him on each of the more or less annual trips that I made to China, and he did many things for me. He arranged for me to be appointed an adjunct professor, as he himself was, at Jiao Tong University. He helped me with access to the Shanghai Museum collection he took me to an important collector who would not have been accessible to me otherwise. He showed me his own collection, which included some interesting paintings, pieces he had managed to acquire on the Shanghai market. 
I had slides of them up. For some reason, I can't find them now. I, if I, I'll include, if I can find it, a detail of one of them, which I remember especially, a painting by Law Peng of the demon queller Junkwe, seated on the pot with an attendant demon holding its nose, carrying away the rag on which he has wiped his bottom. Anyway, Chung Shifa learning of my fondness for those freshwater crabs that are in season for a time each year in the Jiangnan region, Chung Shifa took me to an exp expensive restaurant for an incredible lunch made up of piles of them, from which I consume more than I like to remember. Uh, this photo, of an occasion that I can't remember, records one of the many gatherings he arranged for me. I can't identify everyone in it, but the woman at the far left is his wife. My former student, Judy, and Judy Andrews, is behind at the right, and Lin Xiaoping, who had served as an interpreter and guide on one of my earlier trips and had become a good friend, is at far right. Next. This is a letter that I wrote to Chung Shifa in August of 1981 to let him know that Dorothy and I were coming again to China later that year. I wrote also about his son, Daw Daw, whom we had looked after, as I said, when he came to the U.S. to study. I helped Daw Daw get into the San Francisco Art Institute, while a good friend who had been one of my docents at the Asian Art Museum and was now a collector, Sally Leong, took him into her house and looked after him for a long time. That's another long story. Chung Shir Fa wanted us to stay with him while we were in China, but when I wrote him again that the Chinese Artists Association was sponsoring us and putting us up at one of the Shanghai big hotels, uh, he gave way on that one. Even so, he spent a lot of time with us during our time in Shanghai. Next, please. Here's the last page of Chung Shu Fa's letter to me. Knowing about my weak capacity for reading Chinese, he had my former student Judy Andrews write this letter for him in English, and he signed it, as you see, Chung Shu Fa, your good friend. Next, please. Another group photograph of the kind visitors to China accumulate by the dozens. In this one, besides Chung and myself, are Dorothy and two of my former students who are now living in China, Julia White and Judy Andrews. The men at the far right I can't identify. Next, please. Chung and his wife took us to their house. Here we are outside it. The woman at far left in shadow must have been an interpreter. Next. Mrs. Chung showed us more of his collection. Here she is unrolling a scroll while I'm writing in one of the notebooks I always carried at this time. I'm violating, by the way, good art historian's practice by using a ballpoint pen. Only pencils should be used in the presence of artworks on paper. Next, please. Chung Shifa took me to Sungjong to visit his old home, which he told me was to be turned into a memorial museum for him. I assume this has happened, but I haven't been there to see. Actually, if you Google Chung Shifa on the web now, they take you to a notice of this new museum in Sungjong based on his, him and his collection. Okay, uh, this, muse, this house, which was turned into the museum, is seen behind us in this group photo and in the close-up in the image at right. The young woman at left in the group photo is our interpreter. The younger man at right looks like his son Dodo, but I think that he was already in the U.S. at this time, so I can't identify him. Next, please. Chung Shifa took me to a small park in Sungjong that he said was the site of the garden of the late Ming artist Sun Ke Hung with its unusually large and fine Taihu Shur or garden rock still to be seen there. I will use this photo in a lecture on Chinese paintings of gardens, which will feature a hand scroll painting by Sun Ke Hung himself. These may be the very rocks depicted in it. Be nice to match them up. Next, please. Here's one of the rocks seen for itself. I should devote a lecture to these rocks, but I'm not the person to do it, although I used to lecture on that subject, uh, pointing out that my teacher, Edward Schaefer, had translated an early 12th century treatise on them, Du Wan's Yunlin Sherpu, or Stone Catalog of Cloudy Forests. Next, please. Back in Shanghai, Chung Shifa showed me some of his most recent paintings. He was trying to work into a new style, or at least a style and repertory of subjects quite separate and the ones he become famous for, and was obliged to do. In the image at the left, he holds up one of them sideways for me to photograph. The other one, also depicting fish, is dated to 1984. He's trying to escape from his big, elaborate pictures into simpler ones of cooler subjects, showing that old mastery of composition and brush drawing. 
Next, please. Two more on this new manor from the early 1980, no, 1984, I guess. A picture of lotus pads and blossom with two small fish and one of flowers in a vase, done in that special mode between wash and line that he must have recognized as a special strength that was all his own, which should be developed. But to my knowledge, the paintings in this style never occupied much of his output or became highly praised collectibles as his figure paintings did. Next, please. I'll conclude this long lecture by showing, after a few odds and ends, a group of the late paintings that made Cheng Shifa famous and popular in China. Here to begin with is a work by his follower, Wang Da Wan, a woman. He told me about her, but I never met her. She has mastered the superficials of his style, but her picture is obviously weaker in lots of ways that I needn't point out. Even her signature is like his, but much less sure-handed. Next, please. A big, elaborate painting by Wang Da Wan of the kind that Cheng Shifa himself was producing in his late years, but again, weaker than his in obvious ways. The prominent figure is probably Zhong Kui. The woman behind him in the boat playing a flute is probably his sister, sitting beside the boatman who maneuvers the boat through the stormy sea. In this detail, Zhong Kui strikes a dramatic pose, as some figures in Cheng Zhong weight paintings do. But again, the ink splashes are less representationally effective, Still, she catches much of his style, having learned it directly from him. I have no idea whether he had other pupils or who they might be or what has become of her. Next, please. Here is a fake Cheng Shifa, done by some unknown imitator. I found it hanging in one of the bookstores on Hoping Lu, or Peace Street, the street in Shanghai where the old bookstores are. At first, I was attracted to it, but as I looked longer, the failure of the big ink areas to work as they should and the flatness of the hole disturbed me. I left it and later brought Cheng Shifa to look at it and assure me that I was right. He laughed and agreed that this was indeed a forgery and not even a very good one. Next. The failure of the forger to make his large ink splashed areas work representationally brings out once more the success of Cheng himself in doing just that over and over as if effortlessly. That is, putting on something that looks to you to, not to represent anything at all, and then making it into part of a picture. I should add that this is another case that convinces me that all those dumb arguments about how we are not supposed to look at technical skill in paintings, only at large conceptions, are phony, phony. Proven to be phony by this and countless other examples of this kind. We should forget them. Next, please. Two paintings of Zhong Kui and his sister by Cheng Shifa. The one at left from 1979, the one at right from 1980. He must have turned these out by the hundreds, devising with endless imagination new sub-themes and compositions. Notice how effectively the different kinds of brush drawing create a sense of fast movement in one, of repose in the other. Next, please. A detail from the 1979 picture. The sense of feeling empathically the movement of the artist's arm and hand holding the brush which I've talked about throughout these lectures, is powerfully at work in our response to this one. Next, please. At the same time, we have to acknowledge that Chung is trying too hard in these late works for striking effects and easy popularity. The attitude struck by his Zhong Kui, the way he throws back his head, makes him too much akin to the figures by Fan Tsung, an artist of the same time, whom I'll introduce briefly in another lecture and dismiss as meretricious, uh, in my opinion, for his posturing and grimacing male figures. Next, please. Another large painting of the same two figures, presumably Zhong Kui and his sister. Although the popularity of this painting surely goes beyond that classical subject and has to be understood in the context of the well-known penchant of rich and powerful Chinese men for liaisons with much younger women. A penchant not peculiar to China, of course, but especially open and accepted there. Here the two are seen in a boat, high up in the picture space and removed from us by being seen through willow tendrils, an effective device for producing a cooler, quieter picture. Two geese are seen flying above Chung Kui's head. Next. And as this detail from further down in the picture reveals, other long-necked birds can be seen flying over the water nearer to us, viewed through the willow tendrils. Chang Shifa's long inscription is also written there, in separate parts, as if it, too, were placed further back, behind the verticals that define the frontal plane. Next. 
Some of Chuang Shifa's pictures of this late period, however, and some of the most popular, sacrifice compositional clarity to a deliberate jumble. This big picture of 1978, shown in two images, the left one copied from the, some publication, I, I think it was China Pictorial. At right, one that must be taken from the original. This is a good or bad example. Below the usual images, two girls and deer. Above a riot or a confusion of flowers, mostly wisteria, I think, but mixed with some orange blossoms. Chang Zhifa was by this time a well-recognized public figure, and his paintings were widely reproduced. Another big and overcrowded picture, this one from 1981. An old man kneeling and playing a peepaw or lute occupies the foreground, and behind him at right, a white-robed man holding a ruey scepter and looking rather too ostentatiously noble. The two men need to be accompanied by two younger women, of course, and there they are, one of them holding something I don't recognize. Daffodils and other flowers in the foreground, a pine and other trees beyond fill up the picture area. Next, please. In the same year, 1978, Chung Shifa produced a series of pictures of women of Hong Lao Meng, portraying these popular figures from the most widely read of all Chinese novels, the one translated in English as the Dream of the Red Chamber. I won't try to identify the women. They'll be immediately recognizable to the myriad enthusiasts for this novel. And even I, who read it only in translation and years ago, can recognize some of them without quite being able to pull all their names out of, their, out of my fading memory. Next, please. And I won't comment on them as paintings, except to say that in adapting to popular taste, Chung Shifa has sacrificed most of what some of us admire most in his paintings, and drop back to the level of magazine illustration. Someone else, after searching them out and doing the proper research, can write about the circumstances behind the creation and great popularity of these pictures, a story important for Chung Zhifa's standing in China in his late years. I can only guess at it. This, of course, is, what's your name? The one of the girls sur uh, surrounding Lin Dai Yu in that magical garden the one who draws a plan for the garden, the Da Guan Yuan. Here she is portrayed doing it, looking out at us while contemplating her next move as an artist, managing also to look like one of Chung Zhifa's endlessly smiling young women with upturned faces and engaging smiles. What did it mean for an artist of his caliber and achievement to go on painting these throughout so much of his career when he could, in a different society and situation, have taken other routes that would have been more artistically productive and more satisfying for himself. Unless Chung Shufa wrote out a final testimonial, and I'm not aware that he did, we can only speculate and look at the paintings and feel sympathy and some regret. Next. Finally, two small Chung Shufa images, each of them embedded in paintings by other artists. When Chung came to the U.S. in 1981, he told us immediately that he had been ordered by government agents not to do any painting while he was abroad. They were worried, presumably, that if he did, they would not get their usual big cut of the proceeds. He violated this restriction, to my knowledge, only twice, and only in very minor ways. At our University Art Museum in Berkeley, I showed him, along with many other things, the album belief at left by the late Qing master Ren Bonien, depicting three men standing in a grove of trees. When I bought it in Japan, there was a big spot of red color spilled over it, over the face of the main figure. I gave it to Meguro, my favorite mounter in Tokyo, asking whether he could take it out. He said he would try. When I returned a year later, he brought out hesitantly the, this album leaf to show me. He had indeed taken out the red stain, but he had also removed the face of the figure. So, now in Berkeley, when I showed it to Chung Shur Fa, I told the story and I said that he was the only person in the world whom I would trust to paint in that face because he understood Ron Bonin so well, his style. Uh, he smiled and laughed and agreed to try, taking it back to his hotel room. And when he brought it back, there was the face, not quite so fine, fine as I or he had hoped because he had to paint over a rough surface left by Megado's work. He didn't have a really good painting surface, but still very good and very right for Chung Shur Fa. So there it was, touches of Chung Shur Fa in the midst of a Ron Bonin. Next, final. The other is a painting by C.C. Wong, a rocky seaside landscape 
done in the style he was using then. His paintings never had figures in them. This is the single exception, I think. Chung Shu Fa, shown this, and perhaps only at C.C. C. Wong's request, I'm not sure, painted in, very small for him, one of his noble scholar figures standing on the rock and gazing out over the water, with his servant, or maybe a girl, standing beside him, holding something. C.C. C. later showed me this and told me the story, and I show it here as a remarkable po pictorial document of the coming together of two major artists whom I knew, and a fitting ending for this very long lecture on one of them, my good friend Chung Shu Fa. The second and third parts, as I said, will be devoted to showing all of his AQ illustrations while reading excerpts from the accompanying text. So that's the end. Thank you.